All right, Alexander, let's talk about oil. And uh, the the common thinking now is that oil will hit around 100 a barrel. And the reason for this is because we got quite an unexpected uh, production cut the other day. And uh, this is a production cut that all of OPEC Plus has agreed to, most notably uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia. And so we're going to get a uh, hundred barrel, a hundred dollars uh, a barrel, most likely, yes. most likely, yes. and uh, that's way above the sixty-dollar G7 Collective West price uh, ceiling, price cap. We already have one country in the G7 which has uh, which has received an exception to buy oil above that uh, that price cap, and that is Japan. If oil goes to a hundred a barrel, my uh, my hunch would be that we're going to be seeing a lot more exceptions handed out. But anyway, um, this also signals real quick. This signals Saudi Arabia's trajectory, its move once again towards BRICS, towards uh, the multipolar world. Call it whatever you want. This is another very very bad sign for the Biden White House for U.S. Saudi relations, for the U.S. dollar, reserve currency, petrodollar, yes. de-dollarization, all that stuff. I think this is a ver- another very clear signal of where Saudi and OPEC is uh, is moving towards. And, you know, we said it on the Duran many times. What What did they benefit with this stupid price ceiling other than anger OPEC and Saudi Arabia and the oil producing all oil producing countries for what? So that they could go to the media and say, "Look, we we stuck it to Putin's war machine." Was it really worth it? Because now they're losing everything, including reserve currency status. I mean, you know, we talked about this on Duran multiple times. You are absolutely right in every point that you have made. You're completely correct, and. Can I just say a few quick additional things, and they're entirely additional to your point. First of all, this has obviously been under discussion between the Saudis and the Russians. The Saudis have been talking about this, the Russians have been talking about this, all the other members of the OPEC Plus group are fully on board with this. So they were in discussion about it with each other too. The US was apparently caught completely by surprise. Now, that is a pretty remarkable thing, actually. I mean, it wasn't just that none of the governments tipped the US off, but none none of the officials in any of these OPEC-plus countries tipped the US off. This is the country, the US, with supposedly the most sophisticated intelligence apparatus in the world. But it's clear from the responses yesterday and this morning that the US was taken completely by surprise by this. One country that is not an oil producer, or at least an oil exporter, but a big oil consumer, also seems to have been informed in advance, and that was China, and China has just concluded a major oil agreement with Saudi Arabia, involving major investment by China in Uh, Saudi oil infrastructure, and another important country probably knew what was happening, and that was India. And India, apparently there's going to be another agreement, a swap agreement, whereby India pays for Saudi oil in rupees. So, you know, all of these things are going on, and the United States is not being kept informed. Why are the Saudis doing this? Well, they are obviously furious with the United States. Why are the United Why are the Saudis furious with the United States? Because the policies of the Biden administration show no understanding or concern for Saudi interests. For the Saudis, oil is their business. It's what they do. They have no real other business than oil. They produce oil. And they sell it. It is for them an existential matter. What is the Biden administration doing? By contrast, it is trying to manipulate the oil market downwards. It is trying to manipulate the oil market downwards by imposing 
caps on Russian oil, price of Russian oil, which of course potentially would affect the price of all oil. It's also apparently, and we discussed this in a recent program, threatened Saudi Arabia in private, that, you know, if they pursue rapprochements with China or Iran or Russia, Saudi oil might also be capped. We know that because the Saudis furiously said that if anything like that happened, they would not sell oil to any country that enforced such a cap on them. And last but not least, and I suspect the absolute final straw, the thing that convinced the Saudis a few days ago to go ahead with this, was the fact that the Biden administration, Biden himself apparently, persist in drawing oil from the US's strategic reserve in order to put downward pressure on oil prices. In other words, they're still trying, even as the oil price fell, they're trying to make it go down further still by releasing oil from the US's strategic reserve, even though that is now falling to critically low levels. And the Saudis have had enough, and they've said that if the US goes on doing this, meddling in the market of Saudi Arabia's primary commodity, then the Saudis will take action, and they've just done that, and they've agreed to this major production cut. And I agree, it will go to $100 a barrel, and for two reasons. Firstly, the Chinese economy is now uh, um, surging because it's coming out of its lockdowns, but also because the Saudis, through taking this step, have clearly signaled that they want the oil price to go higher and they will go on cutting oil output until it reaches that higher price. So the Biden administration has achieved exactly the outcome that you said. It's pushed the Saudis into the arms of the Eurasians, the Chinese and the Russians. It's caused the Saudis to cut oil production when the United States wants oil production to remain steady. And the Saudis are now making more deals to accept payment for oil in currencies other than the dollar, specifically the rupee. And of course, they're also planning to join BRICS. And they are now a candidate member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And clearly, they want to be part of the moves to set up the reserve currency in competition with the dollar. So, again, exactly as you said, the Biden administration shows no understanding of Saudi interests, no understanding of Saudi concerns, and look where it's look look at the mess it's created. <laughs> they have no understanding of anything. No. My God. No. It's, every day it shocks me how how awful, how catastrophic this administration yeah. is. It, 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 it really is shocking. Uh, yeah, comment on that and then comment on uh, on Japan, which is the first of what I believe will be many countries ditching this this price uh, ceiling. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to see how quickly it's, that price ceiling is already unraveling. I mean, you know, uh, 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 just just go back, to, go, go back to a few videos and you'll see that we were sort of talking about this. So what has actually happened is that Japan has defected. Now, remember, Japan is a member of the G7. It was the G7 group which supposedly agreed together the oil price cap. And Japan was party to that decision. Japan isn't just a member of the G7. It's easy to forget that it has got the second biggest economy amongst the G7. It's the biggest, big, much bigger economy than Germany, for example. And uh, I mean, so it's the US, Japan, Germany, and then the others. Japan is also one of the three big Asian economies, China, India, Japan. So Japan, along with China and India, in other words, all the big Asian economies, is, or in fact all the Asian economies, but certainly all the three big Asian economies, is no longer applying the oil price cap. Now, 
What clearly happened, there's no doubt about this, is the Japanese came along and they said to the other G7 states, look, we cannot go on with this oil price cap. We need Russian oil. We have to go on importing Russian oil. The Russians will only sell oil to us at a market price. They made it very clear that they are not prepared to send, sell oil to any country that applies the oil price cap. So therefore, despite our previous agreement, we are defecting from the oil price cap. And what then happened, and it's now obvious, is that there was then a sort of face-saving agreement, and you know the G7 said, "Well, you know, let, don't we? We understand that you're going to pull out of it, but we don't want to sanction you because that would be an absolute disaster. We don't want to get into an argument." So they've all pretended that they've agreed that they've agreed to grant Japan this exception, but it was an exception that Japan demanded and would have insisted on. And if it hadn't got it, it would have just gone ahead and bought the Russian oil at the market price anyway. So that's what that was all about. This, this talk about an exception. We shouldn't take it seriously. There is something else. Remember last week when Xi Jinping went to Moscow and met Putin there. And at the same time, the Japanese Prime Minister Kishida went to Kiev and was meeting Zelensky. And that was a very strange meeting because the Japanese didn't really have any reason particularly to go to Kiev. Why did they go to Kiev? Well, I think we can now say that the reason the Japanese went to Kiev was because they wanted to give themselves some degree of political cover as they basically defected from the oil price cap. Money talks. Money talks louder than words. Japan's money is going to Moscow in the form of payments for Russian oil. It's not going to Ukraine. It's as simple as that. It's, 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 it's an absolute utter shambles. And you're absolutely right. If oil prices rise to $100 a barrel, which they're very likely to do, we're going to start to see the whole European Union thing crumble. Because, of course, the European Union, which is the only other entity that's applying the price cap, the reason they're doing, you know, they're already buying oil from Russia through third parties, through middlemen, at more than the price cap. But, of course... If oil prices go on rising, then there will come a point when that just becomes unaffordable and they'll all start to break away. Yeah, yeah. What an embarrassment that's going to be for the Biden White House. Uh, oil going up, the price of gas going up as Biden prepares for his 2020 campaign, his campaign yes. run, I imagine. He's going to, to, to run, and that's going. That's not going to help at all. And uh, you're 100% right. <laughs> you heard it here first. That is the reason why J the Japanese prime minister went to Ukraine. It was payoff money. Yeah, it was, pay it was money. the Japanese prime minister. <laughs> yeah, he went to Ukraine to do the photo, the media, show him handing the envelope to Alensky, the avatar of globalism, the avatar of neoliberalism, Handing him the money to say, are we good? Yeah, we're good. Okay, now I'm going to go back to Japan and I'm going to be buying oil from Russia <laughs> above the $60 ceiling. That's what it was all about. Yeah. Man, these people, these people, my God. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. I don't have a question. I don't have a question. <laughs> no. I mean, you're exactly yeah. right. You're exactly right. That's the reason he went to, uh, to Kiev. The Kiev. Japanese Prime Minister, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, there it is. I mean, that the, the, this all price cap idea was a stupid idea from the start. Only the Biden administration could, could have come up with it. Um, we're now, you know, first, apparently this was all sorted out, you know, the last week of March. How many weeks has it taken for it to crumble? 
Russia, Russia and Saudi Arabia, they called the bluff. Absolutely. Really easily, too. Yeah. Really easy. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's it, these people in the Biden White House are such freaking amateurs. Yes. yes. I mean, they are such amateurs. It really reminds me of the of the day when when uh, when they entered the White House and the Trump, you know, White House left the Trump uh, uh, officials left the White House. The Biden officials entered the White House and the media was saying, now the adults are back. Now the professionals are back in control. Boy, were boy were they one hundred percent wrong on that one? My God, these people! These people couldn't run a lemonade stand. Absolutely, I'm, I'm convinced they couldn't run a lemonade stand. That's no way. <laughs> anyway, any final any final thoughts or comments? I mean, what they made a mess of everything. They have made a complete yeah. freaking mess of everything. Yeah, I mean, we come back to your, uh, your other point, your serious point, about what a disastrous administration for the United States this is. I mean, it's got the United States tangled up in this war in Ukraine. We're now getting more and more reports about how there's more and more doubts about how you know, Ukraine winning, <laughs> succeeding in this offensive. There's comments from the Czech Republic, they're out of arms. Germany has come along. Boris Pistorius, the German uh, defense minister, has said we, can't, we really aren't able to supply any more arms to Ukraine. We've run out. The New York Times has a piece today about how exhausted the Ukrainian army is and how you, morale is falling and how difficult it is to maintain morale. So they got themselves into this conflict with Russia in Ukraine. Um, it was all intended to detach China, Russia from China and perhaps break up Russia. It's consolidated Russia. It's brought Russia and China closer together. It's brought Belarus closer to Russia. It's undermining the international status of the dollar. It's creating chaos in energy markets. It's causing countries like Japan to essentially rebel against U.S. policies, and it's caused the Saudis, in effect, to defect to the other side. I mean, you know, I'm not even started on what the administration is doing domestically. So, I mean, it is a disastrous administration, and I think Americans need to see this not easy to do, given the extent to which the media in the United States still, you know, supports this administration but look behind that wall of words look at what is actually happening in the world saudi arabia and japan two of the us's key allies are each defecting in their different ways saudi arabia openly now japan in the kind of Hole in the corner, <laughs> sly fashion, which we've just seen. Maybe on one specific policy rather than the generality of policy. But, you know, if the Japanese have done it once, it can become a habit. And again, it may not be a coincidence that apparently the Japanese and the Chinese governments got together over the last couple of days and started discussing how they were going to improve the hotline which exists between them. So look behind the wall of words. The media protects the administration. But you don't have to look very hard and very hard, far to see the actual damage it is doing. And as I said, I'm not even starting to talk about the damage it's doing to the U.S.'s domestic policies. Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll leave it there. Uh... It's moving so fast, de-dollarization, multipolar world. It's, it's moving so fast. I, I didn't expect it to go this fast, but there you have it. All right. Uh, Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Rockfin, Odyssey, BitChute, and Telegram. And go to the Duran shop, 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.